Okay, hello everyone. So this won't be quite as quick. What I plan on doing today is a quick, not quite walkthrough. Um, I'm going to quickly go through just the top-down creation of a basic two-dimensional simulation, similar to what will probably be an introductory CFD assignment just to get you familiar with all the steps in the process. There are a couple of stages of this that we haven't discussed in detail yet with any sort of tutorial video. However, uh, it'll give you an idea of what the major steps are, uh, approximately what order they occur in, just generally what's going on so you'll have an idea of the entire top-down workflow for a simulation. So, let's go ahead and start up the software. A second here. Uh, a whole bunch of these menus are going to be appearing off screen. I will do my best to remember to drag them on. So this part I'm showing off screen just because it has the the uh, POD key in it and that can be a little bit sensitive. So we're not going to show that on the recording here, but go ahead and start up a new simulation. And now that that's reset, I'm going to pull this back over here. So it should be opening a new simulation. We will get to that in a moment, as soon as it actually opens. Okay, so the simulation is finished opening up here. So the usual workflow tends to work, not entirely, but approximately top down. So we're going to start with the geometry level. And what I'm going to say that we're looking at here today is going to be uh, not a particularly optimal one, but just a basic converging subsonic nozzle, right? Flow comes in at some speed, it's going to accelerate through a um, reduction in area and it's going to leave at some other speed. So. We could do this a couple ways. We could do this with a basic conical nozzle, which just has a straight linear reduction in area um, with the subtract operation pretty simply. So we're going to go ahead and do that first just to demonstrate that we can. And then we're well, actually, we don't even need to do anything fancy. We can just say, hey, a cone. So let's see here. Uh, if we make this nozzle, we're going to start this nozzle with a radius of, let's go with 10 centimeters. It's going to be 30, 30 centimeters long in the X direction. So the nozzle converging section is going to start at zero, at zero, zero, zero. It's going to have a radius of 10 centimeters. It's going to move 30 centimeters in the X direction. And it's going to end with a radius of five centimeters. We're going to have a cylinder, which is going to start at zero, zero, zero. And it's going to go to negative 30 centimeters. So it's going to go 30 centimeters upstream of the nozzle, the radius of 10 centimeters. And then we're going to have another cylinder, which is going to start at 30 centimeters and end at 60 centimeters with a radius of 5 centimeters. which is going to end downstream of the nozzle. So this is going to be a little bit hard to see uh, because there's no scenes to visualize this. So let's go ahead and go down to scenes. 
right click new scene, open a new geometry scene, and we should be able to see our three parts. A basic conver linear converging nozzle. Not gonna be efficient, not gonna be fancy, but it is a scenario that we can simulate. So, let's go ahead and combine these things. So, we're going to actually name these something appropriate. So I'm going to name this upstream. I'm going to name the second cylinder downstream. Because I intend the flow as seen here to go from left to right. And these are currently three separate parts. So let's go ahead and run a Boolean Unite to combine these three. So this Unite gives us several surfaces to use. But we have a problem here because these surfaces are currently the same thing. The outside cylindrical wall and the end is the same. Hmm. Well, that's a little bit of a problem. So we're actually going to go back to our three parts and right click on all of them and say split by patch. This is a slightly different tool we haven't looked at before, but if you have a scene open, you can split by patch. You need a scene open so it can show you the different colors and the different sections. But what this does is let you effectively manually split surfaces. So if I click on the end here, I can call this outlet and hit create. Notice how this circle disappeared. That means it took that surface and created a new surface, or sorry, it took this part of this entire surface, this entire cylinder, and broke it off as a different surface with a new name. So if I hit close, we see that there's a surface called outlet. There's also the rest of the surface. So we can split by patch all of these and say, I'm going to call this conical wall, create. Or, oops. Uh, we're going to split this by patch again and say outlet wall for this outside surface. Create. You can also split by non-contiguous. Notice how these parts are not touching. So if we right click on this surface, we could split by patch, or we can just separate these out and name them manually. Or we could recognize that they aren't touching, they're non-continuous surfaces. And we can say split non-continuous. So it split those and made them two different surfaces. Because they weren't touching each other in any way. Uh, let's see here. We can also do the same, string with, same thing with the upstream. So we're going to call this the inlet cylindrical face. And this is just the inlet. Or for commonality's sake, we'll call this inlet wall. So now notice this Unite has this little, um, probably a little bit hard for you to see, but this little yellow warning triangle on it, that means we need to update it. We can right click on anything that shows that triangle and say update, and it'll try and update it, or we can hit operations and execute all, and it'll attempt to rerun any operations that we need to. Now, if we look at our Unite, we can see that it's inherited several different surfaces. Oh, 
Although I'm not actually quite sure why it inherited that one. It's possible it doesn't think those were quite touching for some reason. So what we're going to do is take this downstream section and we're going to edit it really quickly. So if we, we can do this a couple of different ways. We can just edit all of the values down here, or we could edit, edit part in current scene and edit the values just like we did before. So I'm going to say 29.9995 centimeters and hit apply. And we're going to execute this again. because it really looks like all well, those were touching barely but they were hmm okay hold on 30 space 0 space 0 Let me try and debug this just a little bit here. This is going to be a more advanced operation. Don't worry about following along with this part. I just want to see something here. Um... Oh no, there's no surfaces in there. It's just a graphical bug. If there were surfaces in there, we'd see them. Let me go ahead and hide this. Uh, if there were surfaces in them, we'd see them right here. So there actually aren't any. It's just a graphical bug for some reason. But anyway, so this is our united nozzle. We have our inlet as the broad side, the outlet as the narrow side. And I'm going to rename this and call this domain. This is the domain that we will be simulating. So if you remember from the last video, how do we go about simulating this? Well, we can do this a couple different ways. Uh, what we're actually going to do here is we are going to want to make this a two dimensional model. This involves a few steps that we haven't actually talked about yet. I'll talk through them briefly here and then make a separate video with somewhat more detail. And the first thing to realize is that to make a 2D simulation, there must exist a plane, a planar surface on the XY plane. So Z equals zero and parallel to XY. We can do that, uh, but we need to cut away some of this material here. So we need to cut away half of our nozzle. Well, how do we do that? We can simply start to negative Let's just make this block really big in X and Y, one, one. We're gonna start this at zero and extend it to one. So theoretically, this should cut off, we look in the scene, this should cut off exactly half of our nozzle. And it should do it at Z equals zero. It's cutting, It's we're going to cut away everything that's above Z equals zero and leave everything below. So we're going to go ahead and click create and we see that we have a really big block. And we're going to run a subtract operation. So boolean subtract. So from our domain, we're going to subtract our block. We're going to select our domain as the target and have it execute it when we create this operation. And we should have a subtract operation. 
Now this appears to be another one of those graphical bugs. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this geometry scene and create a new one. And we're going to actually edit this geometry scene. So the only thing it shows is going to be our subtract. So right now we look at this geometry scene under surface one, under parts, it has everything selected. We don't like that. We only want it to show subtract. So go ahead and click that. And we see that, yes, indeed, we have our half cylinder or half semi cylindrical converging section here. So that's exactly what we want. Perfect. So now what we can do is we need to create a couple more operations. Well, the first thing is we want to add this subtract to a do to a region. So we can simulate it because this is actually what we're going to be simulating. So create a region for each part. This isn't a big deal because we only have one part, but it can be a useful habit to get into in my experience and create a boundary for each part surface. This is important. And we're going to click apply. Uh, so now over here under regions, again, bit of a graphical bug, don't mind that. Um, but we have various surfaces, outlet, the outlet wall, uh, let's see here, our conical wall, our inlet, and our inlet wall. We have these surfaces as boundary points that we can manipulate. Right now, by default, they are all walls. They just say, what they're saying is the no slip condition applies on these. Let me back up a second. By default, every boundary is an adiabatic wall. No heat can flow through it, no flow can flow through it, and it has the slip condition, of, or excuse me, it has the no slip condition applied to it. So it will form a boundary layer. So basically, by default, every surface acts like a wall that can conduct no heat. No heat flows into or out of it. A insulated wall in physics terms. So if we want to do a two-dimensional simulation, which we do for the sake of time, we need to do a couple of things. The first thing is we need to deal with a couple of mesh operations. We need to badge for 2D meshing. One important thing about 2D meshes is, is to realize that they always start as three-dimensional. It always starts as a three-dimensional problem. What you tell it, though, is, no, we're going to simplify this problem and make it 2D. And you do that with this badge for 2D meshing operation. What this does is it looks for a surface that is coincident with the XY plane. And it says, okay, this is my simulation domain. Instead of a three-dimensional space, I'm looking at a two-dimensional surface that is a plane parallel or coincident with the xy plane, so z equals zero. So if we look at regions, let me see here. We're actually going to delete the subtract. I did this slightly out of order. When you're badging for 2D uh, meshing, you actually want to make the region after you've badged the part. So we're gonna do this thing again, and we're going to create a new region for our subtract. There we go. And notice that for a lot of these little symbols here next to names, they've changed. 
this one is pretty much solid red, but the rest of these are just red outlines. So these symbols have changed to denote what is at the edge of the domain, what is one of the edges of your two-dimensional domain, and what is the actual two-dimensional plane that you're simulating. So the solid red is it's saying, hey, this is the surface we're simulating. The outlined red is saying this is the edge of the surface that we're simulating. In this case, the outlet, the outlet wall, the conical wall, inlet, inlet wall. So we've properly defined the domain that we're simulating. Now, let's go ahead and actually create a mesh. We've not talked about this yet in detail. You'll see me go through this, and I will explain some parts of it, but this will definitely require some more elaboration and a further video. But we'll do new mesh, automated mesh 2D. Specifically for two dimensions, this is the one you use. If we were doing three dimensions, you'd use a regular automated mesh. And you tell it which thing do you want to match? For today, we are going to go with a quadrilateral mesher. Actually, no, I lied. We're going to go with a poly uh, polygonal mesher because in 2D, I don't like the way the quadrilateral one works. And we're going to add a prism layer mesher to this. So we get this new operation called Automated Mesh 2D. Um, normally you'd want to select parallel here, but in two dimensions you don't get the option. So serial means it just uses one processor thread. Con concurrent means it still only uses one processor thread, but it will let it do other things. It will let you me mesh other parts simultaneously if you have more than one part to mesh. And then per part meshing is if you have multiple parts to mesh, it'll mesh them independently of each other. We only have one in this case, so it doesn't really matter. But as a matter of habit, I tend to check it because not checking it usually results in problems if you're trying to mesh more than one part with the workflow that I'm used to. So, uh, I think these are all fine. Those are fine as default. Uh, a couple of the basic controls we have, and again, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but I do want to touch on the important parts here, is we have a base size. This is important. This is the size that every other aspect of this mesh is relative to. Most things are in terms of percent. And when they say a percent, they mean a percent of this base size. So we're going to make this, remember this thing is only about, uh, what, 90 centimeters? So about a meter end to end. So a base size of one meter is, in my mind, pretty big. I tend to like the make, to make the base size approximately the size that I want for my cells. So... We're going to go ahead and make this, let's call it 1.5 centimeters base size. And we can change this later. You're not locking yourself into this, but this is a starting point. Uh, CAD projection, so it's going to try and match the edges to where the CAD edges are. Uh, since we have cleanly defined shapes, it can probably actually do this. If we had more organically shaped forms, or we imported our geometry from elsewhere, this probably wouldn't do anything. Uh, part priority, what order is it going to mesh them in if it has more than one part? We only have one part, so it doesn't matter. Target surface size. Think of this as a maximum. It is going to try and make every cell that it can as large as it can up to this value. In this case, 100% of the base size. So it's going to try and make every cell as large as it can 
up to a size of 1.5 centimeters. Now it won't always be able to, based on other parts of the geometry and other things that you tell it, it can't make everything that large. So that's where minimum surface size comes in. This is the smallest it will make anything. So in this case, 10% of the base size, or 1.5 millimeters. Uh, surface curvature, 36. How many points does it use to approximate a circle? Computers don't do circles. They can make things look like really good circles, but they just draw a bunch of straight lines. So this approximates circles by saying that a 360 degree circular arc can be approximated acceptably by 36 points around a circle and just drawing straight lines between those points. For most applications, that works pretty well. Uh, surface proximity is, it will let the mesh be smaller if you have two surfaces that are very close to each other. For our purposes, it really doesn't matter too much um, because our mesh is going to be small enough. We're going to have way more than two cells in here. Um, but if you did have two surfaces that were very close to each other and you needed to make sure there were enough cells in there, surface proximity is something you could use. Uh, surface growth rate is how fast will the surface grow? Um, I'm actually going to specify a value for this. Uh, 1.1. 1. 1. So the maximum amount of size difference between any two adjacent cells is going to be 10%. Number of prism layers. This will make more sense once we see what the mesh on this looks like. Um, but this is effectively the number of cells that's very close to the wall that you're using to model a boundary layer. We're going to go with 8 for today. Um, prism layer stretching, 1.5, that's probably fine. And a half centimeter prism layer. Uh, that might be a little, we're going to knock that down to 25%. So it'll be 3.75 millimeters thick. And we can go ahead and hit execute. Oh, wow, that was fast. How many cells did it put in? Well, it's only about a thousand cells. So if we want to look at this mesh, we can do this with a scene. Just like we used a geometry scene to visualize the geometry, we can use a mesh scene to visualize the mesh. And this is what it looks like. A little bit coarse, honestly, actually very coarse, honestly. Let's go ahead and change the space size down to 0 0.5 centimeters and try that again. Mm, better, but also Still gets, these cells are bigger than I'd like in the middle. So let's try and fix that. We can fix that by a couple of things here. Uh, what I'd like to do is basically say, we're going to use a new custom surface control. So we're going to control the size on a surface. Well, what surface are we going to control it on? We're going to control it on this entire surface. And we're going to say, on this surface, which just highlighted, so everything, make the maximum size, the target surface size, we are going to make it 100% of the base size. So what we should see is that the largest cells will stay about this size. They will not grow like they are here. Execute. Perfect. And I'm actually going to increase this prism layer total thickness up to 50% and run that again.
No, usually mesh takes meshing takes longer than this. This is very quick because this is a very simple problem. Um, it wouldn't be unusual in a full scale three D problem to need to hit mesh and literally be able to walk away and have lunch and come back and it would still be going. Uh, so a couple things. This is a pretty decent mesh that we could use for this problem. We have a couple more steps. We need to tell it what physics we're simulating. So if we go down to physics or continua, the continua folder, we can see that it created a physics one node for us. But there's really nothing in here except for two dimensional and solution interpolation. We told it that this is a two dimensional problem. We told it that because we badged for 2D meshing. So we're going to go ahead and select all the other models that we need. So steady, we're going to simulate water, segregated flow, constant density, turbulent, and K omega. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about these because we kind of already did. Um, but this is basically simple water flow through a converging nozzle. So we're going to rename this as water. And this subtract uses the water physics continuum. So the nozzle domain is simulating water. Now we have these boundaries. We have our outlet. We have our outlet wall. We have really nothing actually technically it's a very small surface you see those tiny triangles right there we we have these because circles are approximations circles are indeed approximations so it's not a great surprise that we've got tiny stuff like this kicking around this is probably fine if it's not fine, we will find out shortly. But this should be acceptable. So we have a whole bunch of walls, but then we also have an inlet and an outlet, most importantly. So we want to change our boundary conditions here. This isn't a wall. The inlet should be letting flow in. So we can go down to type, the bottom left here, and say, this is a velocity inlet. Let's say well, we have some conditions here. So by default, velocity inlets basically say flow comes in perpendicular to the surface. We could also tell it to come in at an angle or with specific velocity components. We tell it what velocity to come in with. We tell it what turbulence to come in with. And in this case, we're going to tell it Let's go with five miles per hour. These can just be walls that should be fine. And our outlet, we can make a pressure outlet. You only really have one value to change for a pressure outlet, or sorry, a couple of values to change. But these only matter if flow has some reason to come back through the outlet. If the flow is leaving, it doesn't do anything. If flow needs to come back in through this outlet, it will come in with this pressure and these turbulence values. And remember, this pressure is relative to the reference pressure set by default up here, which should be 10 or 101.325 pascals. And we're going to set an initial condition of five miles per hour in the X direction. Uh, I think that ought to just about be it. So let's save this. Um, let's see here, where we'll start working directory. There we go. 
conical nozzle 2D. Okay, just to make sure I don't lose the progress if something goes wrong. Saving is a good idea frequently. I actually should have saved probably multiple times already. So let's see here. I think that should just about be it. Uh, we set our boundary conditions. We uh, Initial conditions are mostly default. We updated velocity. Um, we have a mesh. Oh, we probably need to rerun this mesh, actually. Yep, you see how this mesh has this little triangle here? Let's hit execute. So the meshing is smart enough to realize that, hey, this is an inlet. This is an outlet. We don't need prism layers on this, so it got rid of them. These prism layers only really exist on walls with the slip condition, or with the no-slip condition, excuse me. If boundaries do not have the no-slip condition, there can be no boundary layer. Therefore, it does not need a prism layer in general. So let's go ahead and take a look at what does velocity look like to this nozzle. So we can do that by right clicking new scene, scalar scene. So this will let us look at velocity magnitude. So let's go ahead and look at, oh, we're already looking at it. Uh, so let's take a look at this scalar field is what lets us select what we look at. So if we type in, pull this down. Uh, velocity, magnitude, we can see that velocity is five miles an hour, or two and a quarter meters per second, everywhere for the moment. And if we tell it to run, we can see that this starts to speed up. And we can tell it to run And it will continue to run. Continue to run quite quickly as it were. So, let me go ahead and close these scenes and only leave. leave the residual zone. There we go. Yeah, this is running very fast because it has so few cells. But this is what a very stable converging simulation looks like. These residuals, which I'll explain what these are in a later video in more detail, fall very rapidly and eventually plateau and oscillate about fixed values. So if we open up our scalar scene, this is what it thinks this flow will look like. And you could sanity check this. You could say, look at what is the velocity in, what is the velocity out, and make sure that, you know, it should be approximately a factor of four. in between those. Right. Well, actually, technically, no, this is two dimensional, not three, not actually symmetric. So it should just be a factor of two. Um, if it was actually symmetric, and, and this was actually a circular nozzle, then it would be a factor of four. But we can also look at, let me see here, pressure, specifically static pressure. No particular surprise as velocity drops off. Pressure, or sorry, as velocity increases, pressure rises. Or, sorry. As velocity increases, pressure decreases, excuse me, and the reverse. We have the highest pressure at the lowest velocity. We have the lowest pressure at the highest velocity. Exactly what we'd expect for incompressible flow. So this is a nice basic problem 
um, where we can predict with a very high degree of accuracy exactly what this should look like just by hand calculations. Um, we can look at pressure differences and things like that very easily. And if we compare with hand calculations, it's not going to be exact, but it's going to probably be very close to what the simulation is telling us. There are some losses due to nozzle geometry, uh, but by and large, actually we can see how big the losses are. Let's look at total pressure instead. So if we search for total pressure, we can look up total pressure and see that, uh, by and large, total pressure is actually pretty gosh darn constant. We do lose some total pressure near the walls because of viscosity, viscous effects. But by and large, total pressure is very nearly constant across this entire domain. So our hand calculation should probably actually be pretty accurate. But anyways, this is sort of a crash course in a basic simulation. We started with making geometry. We combined geometry in a couple different ways. We meshed it. We selected physics. We made a region. We modified some boundary conditions. We ran it. And we can see some basic results. Uh, we have skipped a couple of steps because we haven't talked about those yet. We will get to those a little bit later, but this is a basic simulation, two-dimensional, top to bottom, in 45 minutes approximately. Uh, so there are a couple of aspects that there'll be need to be additional videos on, especially meshing, selecting boundary layers, and visualizing and processing results. Um, but hopefully this will get people a slightly better idea of what's going on. And if you wish to follow this along and just, you know, pause or slow it down as needed to find where buttons are and things like that, feel free. Uh, additionally, if you're feeling a little bit more self-starter, uh, if we look at the help documentation, so if you go to the help menu and hit help, you get the help documentation, which has tutorials which has tutorials in a number of different things. These do have files associated with some of them. So it says here, this is foundational tutorial underscore one or uh, underscore one dot sim. I believe I provided the batch of tutorial files. Let me just double check this really fast. Um, Actually, I don't have a good way to check this right now. I'm pretty sure I provided these tutorial files as a download link to a Google Drive. Uh, you can download them and you should find the relevant ones there and you can follow along. Uh, but they have many, many, many tutorials on many different topics, ranging all the way from the simple, incompressible, steady flow over a backward facing step, uh, all the way up to, let's see here, what's multi-phase flow, volume of fluid, um, habitation effects. Let's see if it has any fancy images in here, uh, visualizing. Yeah, cavitation effects. So this is an example of, I believe, boiling water i'm pretty sure oh uh volume fraction h2o yeah this is a graphical representation of boiling water due to cavitation effects through a lip here or through a nozzle so you have a tank of water but like this is a more complex tutorial we're not going to go through this um but the water boils due to pressure losses um so there are tutorials if you feel ambitious feel free to look at ones that look interesting and try and follow along i will leave it here and talk to you later